Hello, podcast listeners. This is your host with the most, JJ. Today's episode of JJ Meets World features Katie McGregor. We take a deep dive into the world of psychology, counseling, therapy, whatever you want to call it. We are talking about getting in check with your mental health. Could not be more important these days than checking in with yourself and making sure everything's good to go. Plus, Tucker and I have a wonderful discussion where we have an ask for. I'm not going to get any more into it. I want you to sit back and then relax and enjoy this episode. But first, a quick word from our sponsor. This episode of JJ Meets World is brought to you by Natalie Deutsch of Hatch Realty. Natalie has a proven track record to get your home sold faster and for more money. She is consistently focused on her clients' needs and wants throughout the entire process and make sure that they are well taken care of. If you're looking to buy or sell, reach out to Natalie today. On average, Natalie sells a home every 3.74 days. That's at least two a week. And last year, Natalie earned her clients on average over $4,000 above list price on their homes. And you don't have to take our word for it. Here's some of the great reviews Natalie has received. I was overwhelmingly impressed with Natalie and all the Hatch team. She was very responsive and responded to all of the emails within an hour. She gave great advice and encouragement from the listing and pictures, the offer, and all the closing details. The marketing team team knew exactly how to promote my property, and I was pleased by how soon and easily my property received an offer. I was actually dreading selling my condo, and Natalie did such an awesome job that I felt like I really didn't need to do anything. The thing I most appreciated was that she really listened to what I wanted to do and respected my decisions. I would definitely recommend Natalie and all the Hatch Realty team. They made this process so wonderful. That was from Diane. So listen, if you're in the mood to buy or sell a home, give Natalie a call right now. You can reach her at 701-388-9338, Natalie, N-A-T-A-L-I-E, at HatchRealtyFM.com, or you can go to LiveFargoMoorhead.com, that's LiveFargoMoorhead.com, and find out some information. Huge thanks to Natalie Deutsch of Hatch Realty for sponsoring JJ Meets World. One, two, three, four. <laughs> J.J. Gordon, sort of like that Indiana Jones in that he's always sniffing out his next adventure. Yes, he is! He's always interviewing guests so he can have them on his show and they can talk about pop culture, arts, and leisure. J.J. has his flag unfurled and he likes his french fries curled and he's fun and then he twirls as he goes to meet the world. He will march into the rain even if his ankle sprain. Take a peek inside his brain. This podcast is called J.J. Meets World. I have a just an, a vision in my head of what Dr. Sigmund Freud looks like and all of the ways we use his word nowadays. Do you think he would like to be associated with the word Freudian slip? Uh, and that's a great way to keep your memory alive when people are like, whoa, Freudian slip, dude. And then you share another bush light. Even yeah, even when it's used as like a pejorative, I think he would just be happy that his legacy carries on. He he is sort of if if for a lot of people who even if you've never been to therapy, if someone says you know who who's a famous uh, 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 person in that field, someone would probably go to Freud. Even though I'm not sure if was he actually providing therapy for people or was he more of like a, a scientist in the space? I get kind of confused with the terminology between like psychologist and therapist, you know, mm -hmm. so I don't know if he is if he's more of one thing or the other, uh, you know, or like psychology and uh, uh, what was the other word? Psychology and well, I therapy. I mean, be, yeah, people, not even pe therapy, but there's another like P word. Psychoanal psychoanalysis. Yeah, yeah, like a psychoanalyst. We should have asked these questions in the interview. Yes, we did. <laughs> so if you're listening to this podcast, hoping that's what we cover, we do not. We don't uh, cover that. <laughs> but we do have a, an amazing conversation with Katie McGregor. Uh, Katie McGregor exists in the world of therapy and she just sp talks specifically about who she's helping uh in currently in her career and i am just amazed we we probably have one of the most introspective conversations about 
who we are as human beings. And you definitely get to take a deep dive into what my brain is like in this episode. I think people uh, listening to this episode can really walk away with a deeper understanding. She she gets a little clinical at times, but it's still fully understandable to somebody. And it's actually pretty fascinating. It, it gives it gave me a window even into my own uh, my own uh issues uh katie is a licensed marriage and family therapist for the village family service center and so if you if you live in the fargo moorhead area either you may have or you know someone who has used their services i've used their services before and they're just a fantastic organization so we want to give a quick shout out too just to the the village family service center um who has a lot of people just like katie who are working there to to, to help you through your time in need you know seeking out therapy has often been stigmatized in our society. And I hope if at the very least, if you listen to this conversation with K- Katie, you'll realize it's not bad. It's not scary. It's not something that you should shy away from just because you're afraid of the stigma. Even if you're in a position where you're like, hey, I'm extremely ment- mentally healthy. I think we all need to talk stuff out with someone who is an objective observer. Wouldn't you agree? Oh, I wholeheartedly agree with that. Um you you don't realize that something you think uh, is is weak actually makes you stronger, right? Um, sort of like gelatin. So oh, okay, therapy is gelatin, and I am a piece of mandarin orange, <laughs> and it helps set me from just flopping on the top or sinking to the bottom. It allows me to <laughs> to stick wherever I need to stick. So that's the kind of deep stuff that you're going to get in this episode. So (laughs) I want you guys to sit back, relax and enjoy this episode. Uh, And this is probably one that you want to download and save because you're going to want to share it to other people as you go on. And speaking of sharing and downloading, I'm asking this is my plea. If you could please uh, rate us on Facebook or uh, not Facebook (laughs) on uh, actually, actually, no, uh, rate us us on Facebook, uh, our page. You can give us reviews on Facebook. You can like our page. Um, So basically, like the two places that we are most active right now are Facebook and Apple podcasts. And so what JJ is getting at is if you want to support the podcast and maybe in this time of uncertainty where, you know, cash flow is a real problem for a lot of people, you know, we would love it if you donated to our Patreon, but you, it would be also be equally awesome. Maybe if we could get a five-star rating on either Apple podcasts or on, on Facebook, that would really help us out a lot. And if you could just hit the subscribe button, we also think that that would be awesome. Even if you don't listen to every single episode, just hitting subscribe, it makes us look so much better to I guess the CEO of Apple is probably wondering every day, like how many people are subscribing to JJ meets world. Well, I better check. Tim cook is definitely, (laughs) we're definitely on his radar for sure. (laughs) Yeah. As I like call him, Tim fry cook. Um, (laughs) So we would appreciate that. That'd be awesome. But I don't want to take any more of your time. I want to get into this episode of JJ meets world featuring Katie McGregor. JJ meets world. Welcome to JJ Meets World, Katie McGregor. How are you doing in this uh, social distancing world these days, Katie? <laughs> you know, it's kind of been up and down. Um, there have been there have been good days, and then there have been some days where I'm like, oh, I'm just you know uncertain about what the future holds and what it's going to look like and when it's going to stop. So I think just like everyone else, I've been having um, some ups and downs. I find more often than not that this was sort of like a dream people had for a while of like, oh, wouldn't it be great if I, you know, got stuck at home for a while and I'd get all these projects done. But the fact that you're reduced in the amount of freedom you have to be around other human beings is the thing that makes this go from a dream to a nightmare in in a lot of ways. Uh, I just I'm I'm craving even something like just chatting with someone at the gas station and saying like, Oh yeah, it is kind of nice out today, isn't it? And be like, Oh, Oh yes. A sweet, sweet chat. (laughs) That's funny. Yeah, no, I agree. Now uh, Tucker's telling me that you've got uh, a pretty amazing background in the mental health field, which is something that I think in the last, I'm going to say decade, People have really started to zero in on and it's become much more of a 
uh, conversation that people are having and people are much more open about how they're feeling and uh, their needs when it comes to mental health. What's it like to be in the field when it's really, really being appreciated right now? Well, actually, I specialize in the zero to five population. So a lot of my work is working with really young kids who have experienced neglect, who live in the foster system, who have a history of sexual abuse, um, not so good, not so good experiences. So I do a lot of trauma work with really young kids and their caregivers. And that's actually an even newer part of the mental health field. This this kind of zero to five work has really exploded, I would say, in the last, you know, five years um, as a specialty. Because before we just wouldn't treat kids that young or really acknowledge that uh, maybe they remembered trauma. And now we know that it affects them profoundly for the rest of their lives. And we have evidence-based um, methods and treatments to help them recover. So um, it's been, I mean, it's been really important and really important work. And I'm grateful to be a part of it. When it comes to that age group, uh, oh, I can't even imagine how difficult it is to walk away from your job at the end of the day and not carry so much with you. Can you t- t- talk a little bit about how you uh, maintain your own uh, mental health during something like that? Sure. You know, when you're working with um, a dyad or like a caregiver and their child, you have to be the regulated person in the room, right? You need to be calm so that you can hold them and help them. And so a lot of this is work on reflecting on your own, on your own history, what triggers you, um, really recognizing how you're feeling inside when people are sharing difficult things so that you can attend to yourself before attending to them. Because I always say, you know, if you're triggered or if you're feeling upset um, or if your stomach's hurting when someone's telling you something, you've now become unhelpful because you're no longer a calm, regulating presence. So I have a lot of experience and practice working on self-regulation, um, being able to stay calm in moments that are difficult. And then I also see the rewards of people getting the help. And so I hold hope for a lot of these families when maybe they can't. And I hold that hope you know, with me, even after I leave the session. So I think that's part of my, my own self care is to, to hold the hope and to stay regulated, to be very aware of how I'm feeling and do the things I need to do to stay calm. What made you decide to get into this particular uh, field? Well, um, you know, I I started at the village probably like 13 years ago, and I started with the Moorhead site, which was child-focused. Before that, I'd mostly worked with clients living with HIV and AIDS. Um, I'd worked with the transgender population. I led the tri-state transgender group for several years, and so it was kind of a big switch for me to come to the village and just see children. Um, the office in Moorhead is a children's clinic. Um, some of the, so I did get some extra training. I went to a second master's program at the U of M for early childhood, um, infant mental health and development. And so I, w- I actually got, um, spe- like a lot of extra specialized training in the field, which really piqued my interest. Um, and, you know, I met some of the four, like the researchers on the forefront of our field, um, are actually at the U of M. And listening to them talk about the neuroscience of development and um, how children develop in the context, you know, of their environment and with their caregiver was just fascinating to me. So it really kind of pushed me to want to do this work. And when you talk about childhood trauma, um, is is there a pretty clear definition of what we consider trauma or uh, does it vary? individual to individual? Sure. So 
there's some there's something we kind of call an ACEs score, which are kind of the things we know definitely creates um, trauma in young children. But it's also kind of a mix of what you just said. It can be it can be individual. It's all based on you know our own genetics, how we function, what one person considers you know, traumatic, another person, and it might be kind of like a bump in the road. And so there are definite behaviors and signs we look for that lets us know that there has been trauma. And a lot of it for young kids is disruption in their typical like eating, sleeping um, routine, their ability to you know, use their caregiver to calm and soothe. Those are the sorts of things we start to see become disrupted when they've experienced a highly stressful experience. Um, You know, some of these experiences involve like multiple moves. If a child has had multiple moves in their past, um, if the caregiver was using drugs and not emotionally present, or if they've even had a very depressed caregiver who wasn't able to attend to them in a consistent way, um, that can all be considered trauma. Obviously, witness Witnessing lots of domestic violence or, um, you know, not just not being attended to in a consistent manner can really lead to some disruptions in development. I, um, I think of times in my life that I probably uh, didn't recognize warning signs or uh, when people reached out for help at certain moments. And obviously hindsight's 2020, but as I go forward, it really, it really amazes me that we are getting better about talking about these things as they, as they progress. And as I mentioned at the beginning of the podcast, how we are more in tune with the, the fact that this is mental health. It is health for the same reason why if you were sick and needed uh, to go to the to go to a doctor to cure uh, a virus that uh, you're suffering from. It's the same thing where if you are having issues in the mental health department, seeking out that wh- whatever it is, whether it's group sessions or private therapy sessions or it, some of the stuff that works even deeper. I, I just am amazed that in your field, there are people who are discovering new uh, aspects every single day. I mean, it's almost like Star Trek, right? It's the undiscovered <laughs> country. Yeah, no, I agree. It's, you know, because it is a newer field where re- we're realizing so much more about how your mental health actually affects your physical health. Um, and so a lot of times, you know, yes, you, yes, your mental health is very important and people are taking that more seriously, but we're also realizing how closely it is tied to your physical health and your behavior and everything else. You know, some, some studies have shown that um, your ability to actually be able to talk about your history, your own history, your story in a way that's coherent and makes sense, but doesn't overwhelm you is directly linked to your functioning today. Mm, interesting. What about um? Is there any work in uh, being done about addiction in younger children? Um, I know, like a lot of times when people talk about addiction, they think of uh, drug abuse, alcohol, prescription medications. Uh, but are kids? Becoming addicted to anything. I think of like things like screen time. Uh, I mean, and this is just me personally, but sugar and substances that we're putting into child- foods aimed at children. That's a really good question. That's definitely not a specialty um, of mine. Addiction isn't an area of study for me, but obviously I see a lot of parents utilizing screen time at, at rates for their kids that definitely is not recommended. You know, like right now, I think the recommended amount is half an hour to two hours a day. Um, And we're seeing much higher use of that, which, you know, again, it's just, it's not good for your mental health because you're not getting outdoors. You're not doing imaginative play. You don't know how to handle boredom. You're used to um, being stimulated, you know, like quite quickly by a device or by something. And so I think you're, you're unable maybe to even handle times like this where we're home and, and it's kind of like, what's your hobby? Who are you outside of 
you know, going to school or your job or what it is, whatever it is, people aren't really so sure because there's so many distractions in life, like looking at your phone. Katie, yeah. have you guys in your own household, because I know you're cooped up with Matt McGregor and that's gotta be, <laughs> that's gotta be like, if I don't know if I would put him on my short list of quarantine partners because I, I love the guy, but you know, in doses, right? So are you taking, you know, have you guys had to though, in all seriousness, um, you know, JJ refers to it as I think today is separate couch time day. Um, are you, are you guys able or have you implemented anything to kind of help keep your own mental health, you know, in check during this time when you really just can't get away from anybody, right? Yeah. Well, you know, we've done a few things. I I think that both of us had been actually really busy because I'm still working from home doing telehealth. Um, I, I see clients over Zoom. And so my day is kind of filled with appointments. And then previously, Matt had been taking care of our three-year-old son, Beckett, during the day and then working at night. And so he would wake up super exhausted, ready to take care of Beckett the next day. And then I would have to go to a room to isolate to do my work. And I was starting to kind of become really restless. Um, I wasn't outside enough and I was starting to just kind of feel cooped up. But luckily we had our parents, um, my folks take take our three-year-old for a week. And that really, really helped. Um, Matt's been able to sleep at night. Um, we've been able to like go on walks um, multiple times a day together. We downloaded, I don't know if you've heard of Masterclass. Oh, I love Masterclass. Okay, so we got, a, yeah, we got a subscription and we started doing that together. Um, so that's been really good. But there's definitely been moments, you know, like where you're around someone for a lot and you're kind of like, um, why are you doing that that way? What do you always do it that way? <laughs> <laughs> I don't like the way you're chewing your food right now. You're chewing your food in a way too aggressive manner. And I need you to chew your food in the bathroom right now, please. It's like all of a sudden I'm seeing you under a microscope, right? And I'm like, what do you always do that? <laughs> you know, Dr. Phil had, a. Uh, a re really great set of uh, parameters for couples during uh, a time of uh, self-isolation. And they included things like having a safe word um, so that if you because let's face it, there are certain moments where you walk into a room and you haven't talked with anyone for a while and something just drives you crazy. Be like, that was the last piece of bread for toast. How dare you? And instead of having an <laughs> argument about it, both of you look at each other and say pineapple. And then you just walk away and the fight never starts. In fact, here, here are his list of 10 things. Be honest. Acknowledge up front that you're stuck together and this is how it has to be. Two, make a list of annoyances. The more upfront you are about what you can't stand about each other, the more likely you are to avoid those behaviors. I would <laughs> never do that. Not in a million years. Yeah, I can't imagine someone going, hey, by the way, I've taken the time to write down all the things you do that drive me insane. Right. But, Especially like because... An argument waiting to happen, doesn't it? <laughs> right. And I feel like you, you know, it's sort of like you have to make the list and then sit together with no writing utensils because you can't get angry and defensive and add some more things to the list during the conversation. <laughs> uh, number three, don't argue in front of the children. Four, have mm -hmm. a safe word. Five, rotation time. Alternate your time in different parts of the house so you're not always on top of each other. Six, a good pair of headphones. Seven, vary your routine so you don't do the same thing every day. Eight, don't be a disgusting slug. Nine, pay attention to the first four minutes of the day. Now, this is, I think, advice that people get scrawled onto their bedroom wall uh, in some really nice, uh, you know, stickers or or uh, some calligraphy. Um, instead of... Uh, it, Remember, what you do in the first moments of interaction with your partner will set the tone for the rest of the day. And then last but not least, before you judge someone, keep in mind that you're probably a piece of crap, too. <laughs> <laughs> I like that last one. That's <laughs> yeah, that, Those are some good tips. Way to go, Dr. Phil. Yeah, being humble. Dr. Phil. Oh, Dr. Phil. Um. <laughs> Yeah, I think that he touched on some of the things that uh, maybe in a, a, a more humorous way, but that are well known among marriage and family therapists, 
which um, some people call these the four horsemen, right? The predictors of divorce. And one of the biggest predictors is called stonewalling. It's where you've reached the point where you can no longer talk to the other person about something or they basically stonewall you, right? Where they'll ignore, they'll use the ignore tactic to basically isolate or distance themselves from you and what you have to say. And that's that's one of the biggest, the other, another really big predictor of um, pretty significant problems is if you're in a conversation and it's it gets tense, and like you said, this is this is a great use of that safe word or whatever. But basically, you you float out a joke and the other person can't laugh. You know what I mean? Like say say you're in a really tense argument about leaving your underwear all over the floor. I don't know what it might be, but, and, and, and one person makes a bit of a joke about it in the middle of a really tense moment. If that other person can't crack a smile, that's a huge predictor of, of, you know, we've reached a point where we can no longer enjoy those, those little moments and relax a bit. Um, so that's, that's one of those things. I think Dr. Phil touches maybe on some of those things in a slightly different way, but it's, kind of all the same. It's all similar, similar ideas. And, you know, maybe we should just refer to him as we're supposed to his, he's just Phil. I mean, he's as much uh, like a doctor <laughs> as I am an astronaut. So unless you start going to start calling me captain Gordon, I don't, <laughs> I don't really feel the need uh, to get into a, a conversation like that. Um, okay. So here's a, uh, here's another question for you, Katie. So when when people find out you're in the line of work that you are helping people, do they so try and solicit free advice or do they feel like they can just instantly open up to you about something? Um, what, what, what's it like to, to wear that? Because le- I have a friend who's a butcher. And if I ever have a question about meat, I immediately call and interrupt whatever they're doing. And say like, hey, the fat cap on this is pretty big, but can I still grill it fat side down? And he'd be like, JJ, <laughs> it is my wedding day. I can't answer questions like this. Ah, uh, you know, it's a mixed bag. It depends what I tell people or what they think I do. Some people, because my title is marriage and family therapist, people seem to be really willing to open up to me about maybe problems in their relationships. And they like to come to me about that. But when they know my specialty is helping parents and young children in development, they're much more wary to even bring up things about their kid. I think they're worried about being judged or they're worried their child isn't normal or they're worried I'm somehow, an, you know, this expert and know all the right and wrong answers about raising kids. And so then I think they're worried about being just so it kind of depends on what kind of therapist they're wanting or think I am. Um, let's, uh, I, and this is not in any way to poke fun at your profession, but let's say Tucker and I are a couple, <laughs> right? <laughs> and we've known each other long enough and we've spent enough time together. We've lived together that I feel there have been certain moments in our relationship that probably could have dealt with a little bit of counseling, uh, and a little <laughs> bit of guidance to keep us, uh, better. So for example, communication between Tucker and I could probably be improved partially because I'm a person who, when I feel uncomfortable in a situation, will try and make a joke and move away from it quickly. And uh, Tucker, how do you feel if you get uncomfortable in a, in a conversation? Uh, I, I actually typically, I, well, I I'm speaking, I I may, I may not be correct because I'm giving my own self bias here, but I think I typically, address it as soon as possible because I get really uncomfortable with things lingering. So um, either if it's something where I'm just not fully invested in what's going on and it gets uncomfortable, I might just remove myself from the situation. But say if I think of any time, you know, when I've had issues, like let's say I'm dating someone and my girlfriend, I can tell is mad at me. I don't like that to linger. I, I'm like, we need to address this right now because this is going to drive me insane if we don't talk about it because I'm just going to cycle on my own. So I'd rather we air it out than have my crazy anxiety cycle go through my head. Luckily with you and I, JJ, um, yeah, we've certainly had those moments, but we also have the kind of, we, we have a distance 
like an actual physical distance that friendships get to have that romantic relationships don't typically have when they're <laughs> serious and you're cohabitating together. Right. Which is very nice. Uh, not that it, uh, that came out wrong. I, well, I mean, I guess no, the first thing no, you I, say I, is how I, you really feel, I, right? I, I agree, man. I mean, like, like I'm someone who, uh, uh, I, 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 I love all my friends, but I can't think of a single friend I want to live with right now. You know, do you, when you're talking to uh, like, let's say a, a, a couple, and the way they interact back and forth, do you ever uh, talk about, well, how would you how would you approach this with your friend? How would you approach it with a coworker? Because sometimes I feel like I get so defensive immediately uh, when I get a, sing- a simple phrase from my wife that I and I would never react that way with someone outside of that relationship. <laughs> Sure, you're kind of touching on some patterns. And, you know, I'm thinking about two different things right now, because um, some of the things you said triggered me to kind of think about adult attachment styles and how we function in close relationships with other people based on how we were raised. Um, So I'm just going to touch on that first. Um, Actually, there's, (laughs) I I don't know if this is too much education for (laughs) Um, I don't want to. I don't want to provide too too much um, education on the show and keep it light. But say, you know, a lot of people have found that there are four common attachment styles um, in adulthood um, that have you functioning in romantic or close relationships in some distinct different ways, and you can actually kind of plot them on a chart. And you know, the best the best place to be would be to have low what we call attachment anxiety and low attachment avoidance. And when I use the word attachment, I mean how we use other people to feel calm or feel good. And we find that under stress, people tend to be either avoidant or anxious or a mix of the both. So for example, a secure attachment looks like two people who can utilize each other to feel calm, who maybe feel stress in times where that makes sense and they can lean on each other without overwhelming one another. Their communication is pretty good. They're there for each other. But let's say you're under stress and it's a pandemic and it's like a really difficult time or one person has some financial problems. Um, And I actually find this is even more common in the Midwest. You might actually be very avoidant, right? Now your attachment, you're under duress. And so you're more an avoidant um, partner where you feel like, I need to solve my problems on my own. I'm not going to use someone else. I need to pull myself up by the bootstraps. I don't share my my deepest feelings with the partner when I'm really under stress. And so then your partner's kind of looking for ways to like be closer to you and, oh, why didn't you tell me about that? I could have helped you or or whatever. And I feel like in the Midwest, we're, we're a bit more what I would call dismissive of the importance of attachment when we're under stress. We kind of feel like we want to solve our problems on our own right um Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and that's that's not the most healthiest place to be and then on the other spectrum you could get very anxious and feel like oh i really need to like lean on this person for help and i'm going to be calling them every day and i'm going to need to like replay out my situation and problem and sometimes like say if this is a couple we might call that oh you know we all know these couples that are kind of like needy right (laughs) (laughs) or one person's needy and the other person's like, Oh, it's overwhelming me. Like, you know, whatever that might be. And, and anyway, there's other, there's other common places people fall kind of with this attachment, how we use each other to feel good or safe. And depending on like who your friend is or who you're partnered with, it can, it can kind of form like these different patterns. And so, which, which leads to this last example that you said, where there's this, um, maybe a situation where your wife says something and it really kind of, it really kind of triggers you, um, where it might not, if it was just a friend. And that's because when you're in close, like a really close context with someone, there isn't just one thing that's said outside of that context, right? <laughs> um, you, you can't just single out that one comment and because when you're around someone a lot, 
There's a certain way you feel about yourself depending on your interactions with them. There's certain assumptions you've made about how they feel about you. And that is much more personal and intimate than, say, a coworker or someone else. And so within that context, someone could say something and it becomes more of a story about what you think they think about you. (laughs) <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Does, it, does that make sense it absolutely does and you can get as technical as you want because this is really intriguing to me um okay years ago my mom gave me a book on body language that was written probably back like in the 60s um I mean, it had been updated by the time she bought this copy and she gave it to me and I devoured this book inside and out when it came to body language. And I think of it when I'm interacting with another person and I'll find myself uncon- you know, unconsciously doing some of these things to say like, oh, you know, he's I'm crossing my arms because I think that the conversation is done and it's time for me to, you know, put a bound, a physical boundary up in front of myself. And so I will try and undo those things while I am uh, speaking with somebody. Mm -hmm. But I think I do the do mental things as well, where my brain at one point says, well, this conversation is done. So I'm going to kind of shut off or I'm going to start thinking about some other stuff. So by the time this person stops this sentence, you go, well, yep. Okay. So good to see you. <laughs> Where really I haven't been present in the last five minutes of a conversation. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It, do, I mean, when is it? Okay. So let me ask you this. Is it hard to turn off some of those skills and education that you have garnered over the years when you're just chatting with somebody at the grocery store? I mean, is it hard to, to walk around and not, uh, try and be um, not necessarily diagnosing, but not noticing the things the rest of us aren't noticing? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, it kind of, I, I feel like, you know, when I come home or in my day-to-day life, I do not have my therapist hat on anymore. And I'm, I'm just as lost as everyone else, right, in my own situation. <laughs> It's kind of, and, th- and that's probably kind of how it is for, for lots of people in their professions. You know, it's like, it's when you're looking at other people, it's one thing, but then when you're in your own life, it's, it's, uh, a bit maybe turned off. However, there are moments that I notice, um, I'm in conversations with people for a really long time. People seem to be, you know, sharing really intimate things with me and I barely know them. And maybe I just met them in a store or something. And then I kind of realize it's because I've cultivated, you know, these things that you're talking about where I know that other people really like to talk about themselves and I'm a really good reflective listener. I show really genuine interest when other people are talking. There's all sorts of skills I use. I think that make people feel safe around me. And then I start to realize that, oh, maybe this isn't an appropriate place to be sharing all this stuff. And what do I do with this now? You know, I'm not, not in a therapy office. And so um, I find myself in those situations as well. So, yeah. One, one thing I like to do when I'm having a conversation with somebody in a group is if somebody mentions something but kind of gets stepped on or railroaded by somebody else, I always like to follow back and be like, okay, Karen, you were saying this. And just to get that, uh, that last piece of the conversation out of them, because I, I mean, I'm one of those people who uh, I, I feel I'm driven a lot by empathy. And uh, I, I tend to be the person that has a lot of relationships, but uh, I consider like 20 people my best friend, right? The people I'm really, really hunkering down with. Uh, when I made the guest list for my wedding, it was one of the most impossible tasks <laughs> I've ever had to do because I said, well, we couldn't do it without so-and-so. And I find a lot of the time I am giving somebody 70% of what I could in a friendship instead of giving them a hundred percent. But it's because 
I am giving you 70% because I need to also give this person some time and then this person gets some time and nobody gets that full dedication when it comes to just even something as basic as a conversation. Um, because in the last year I've learned the word no, and it's a very <laughs> powerful word for a person like myself. Um, because I love saying yes. And I, part of the problem was, is that I would overcommit and I'd be super stressed out and I'd be doing things, but I loved everything I was doing. I always got something great out of these moments, you know, on the days when we record four episodes of JJ meets world and all of a sudden half my day is gone. I love the product I end up with, but it is sort of daunting thinking of giving up all of this time. And so as I've learned to say no to people, it is uh, it's very powerful. But at the same time, I'm really living in this world of fear of missing out. Well, and JJ, FOMO. I think I think you've I think you've just raised a really good point about something that I think we're all struggling with under this new normal, which is 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 setting new boundaries because um, since everything is basically just being done online in the comfort of our own homes, what used to be segmented into times of day, like from this time to this time is when I'm working. And then this is my time. And then from this time, I, you know, I have to go do a theater B thing. But now we've all, since we're all kind of always in the same situation, I think a lot of people are still a adapting to designating times for certain things to happen when you know you can reach someone almost immediately. So Katie, I mean, is that something that, you know, uh, is, is important for people to kind of understand and digest a bit is that because just because you're now stuck at home and you have constant access to the internet does not mean that you need to be constantly available for all the things in your life that might be asking for some of your attention and energy. Yeah, I think that's absolutely true. Um, I was thinking about that the other day when I was in this uh, conversation with my brother. And it's so great because normally we don't just FaceTime for a long time. You know what I mean? Like an hour could go by and I get to see my nephew and I get to play with him. Um, and so there's like these good things that are happening. But then there's also you know, these times where social workers are calling me and all these other people are, you know, calling me for my work or different reasons. And typically I'd be too busy in a session to respond to all these people. <laughs> but now I can literally just like pick up and somehow do it all. Right. But it's not true. I can't, you can't do it all. Um, I found that saying no to things. I, I mean, it's good to know what fills your cup and, when I say fills your cup, you know, what keeps you happy, what keeps you motivated, but it's good to also know when it's too much and saying no is a lifelong process. I don't think it, I think it happens with age and experience, knowing your limits, um, that feeling too, that when you get older, you don't need to please everybody. Um, that kind of comes sometimes I think with, <laughs> with knowledge and age, um, and practice, and also, I, I think people are surprised when they set up a boundary and say, nope, I'm actually too busy with this. I can't I can't invest in that right now. Um, but please ask again. People typically aren't mad. I think the assumption is people are going to somehow be disappointed or mad if you say no. And that's often not not the case. Um, yeah, I mean, with with the podcast, you know, with JJ Meets World. So under normal operating circumstances, every it's usually Saturday morning is when JJ and I have blocked out the time to do our podcast recording, and uh, which is which has always been with people coming into the studio and actually sitting across the table from us. And it kind of took us a couple of weeks here. I mean, and this I'm definitely at fault for this too to realize that we should maintain that same schedule if we can, even though we're doing this online, which gives us more flexibility of time. You know, if a particular guest isn't available at that time. You know, we can certainly we can certainly pivot if we need to strategically, but there's a lot of value for JJ and I to go, you know what, we're maintaining our same recording schedule for our own mental health and time instead of just going, well, now that we have, you know, Zencaster and the Internet and we're doing all of our podcasts online, we can just record it any old time. Right. Like it being able to do it this way is probably going to help JJ and I not 
bite each other's heads off when we're reaching out to each other about, you know, hey, are you free to record at this time or that time? It's we know our Saturday block is when we're going to try to do it as best we can. Yeah, I think we all operate best on a schedule, you know, (laughs) there's, I I just think that the closest you can keep your day to some, some kind of, you know, routine or schedule, um, the better you're going to fare during this time. And, and even the little things, you know, like getting up in the morning and opening all your windows, um, not letting it be dark, you know, in the house and ha- just doing your doing daily rituals, I think is really helpful. Keeping a typical schedule. Um, we know all those things are really important right now, but some people's schedules have totally been upended. You know, I have lots of clients who maybe only have one device in their home. And so, you know, mom is sharing a computer to do her own work from home. The kids then have to rotate it to complete their school. <laughs> and everybody's, you know, on this very, um, it's just this new routine that doesn't always, doesn't always make a lot of sense. So that's hard. Do, um, do you ever find that, Sometimes and when it comes to just simple communication, you just wish all of us never had learned sarcasm. (laughs) Because I feel like we could get so much more done without sarcasm or or I would I would also pivot and say or the word fine, because the word fine, if you look it up in the dictionary, should have about 10,000 different meanings. And only one of them is equivalent to okay. Everything else seems to be just layered. I mean, when I think of the F word, I think of the word fine because people say it, but they don't really mean it in a lot of occasions. Sure. It's kind of a filler word. Um, How are you doing today? Fine. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Right. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, that's the good thing about therapy is that um, I use, I actually use silence to combat a lot of that. Um, (laughs) People are uncomfortable with with silence. I'm not because I've gotten so used to it over the years. And so I could spend, you know, it's very uncomfortable if no one's saying something for, say, like 20 seconds. That's a long time of... I mean, it might, it's only 20 seconds, but it seems like the other, to the other person, like an eternity, like they need to fill it with something. Um, so when someone says fine and, and I just say, oh, you know, and I'm, you know, say, you know, I might say, say more about that or, or, you know, something, but if you leave some space there, people are usually pretty eager to fill it with, their thoughts and how they really are feeling. They just don't know if it's safe to do, you know? You know, it's funny you mention that because Tucker at one point paid me one of, I think the finest compliments about our friendship ever. We were driving down to visit his grandmother in Kentucky and somewhere in the armpit of America, AKA Indiana, (laughs) we, we hadn't spoken for a long time in the car. We were just kind of, You know, the music was on low. We were just kind of listening to the roll of the highway. And I was ready to start going. (laughs) Just doing something to fill the silence. And Tucker said, it's really nice that we're so close uh, as friends that we can just be here in silence. And thank God he said it when he did, because I was just about at my breaking point. And it was really, (laughs) it was really nice. I really like appreciated that. And I go forward thinking like, oh yeah, it is nice when you can be with somebody and you don't have to be constantly saying stuff and making noise. Well, part of it is also being okay with yourself. You know what I mean? Just that ability to just be in the moment and not feel like you have to entertain or be something to someone else or part part of that comes from you too, you know, your own ability to be comfortable with your own self, um, not just with the other person. Mm, Interesting. Because I am very much not somebody who can handle just silence. I always have to be doing 
something. And so every now and then my wife will catch me making faces at myself <laughs> in the rear view mirror if we're not talking enough. Yeah, but I'm I think- I'm the I'm the exact opposite. I mean, if I go for too long without silence, it starts to drive me crazy. And I think that's probably what uh, it's probably a shared trait with a lot of introverts is that um, you know, it, it's not that you don't like to socialize or you don't like to have noise, but it does drain you over some time. And the the best way to recharge is just to even just to be able to sit silently for a couple of minutes and just soak in not having any any signal coming into your brain is is typically how I feel about it. So I, I always look forward to hanging out with my friends who I know I can just be quiet with. Like that's some of the best hangout time for me. Sure. That's filling your cup. Your, qu- right. <laughs> your quiet time. That's recharging for you. Right. That makes sense. Yeah. What about um, when you get a, a chance to just like refill your cup, Katie, what is the, well, what, what is your evening? What does your day look like where you get to, to find time for yourself? Well, I really, I, I mean, I really like to be alone right when I first get home and not talk too much because I feel like, you know, I've done that all day (laughs) and it's almost as though I just need to go for a walk or sit and do some yoga. Um, I actually learned a lot. You had um, Brenda Weiler on your podcast. I've used Brenda Weiler quite a bit um, in the last 10 years to learn how to focus on myself, to just be, to relax, to use yoga as a way to unwind. Um, she's been like a phenomenal help in my life. Um, right now I'm actually 35 weeks pregnant and I've been doing the prenatal yoga with her, which has been really helpful because, you know, during the pandemic time, I have a lot of worries on my mind about the baby and going to the hospital and not being able to have visitors and, you know, everything's, everything I imagine is kind of shifted right now. And so I'm not afraid to, you know, reach out if I need to and, you know, get, get some of what I need met through someone who knows more about meditation or mindfulness than me. Every therapist needs a therapist. Do you know what I mean? And if I've, if I've had a session that's really triggering, I luckily can call my supervisor and um, get out my feelings and get support Um, I always tell clients, you know, what's shareable is bearable. And that goes for me too. You know, if I can, if I can get out something that's bothering me, it does, it feels bearable. And so, you know, just having some of that personal time to myself um, in the evening and being able to just be in a routine with my son and separate family life from work life. That's all just really important to me. Oh, that's great stuff. Um, I have always heard that before. Every therapist needs a therapist. Um, and it's, it's, I think it's such a telling thing because you know the value of it more than anybody else. Right. And mm-hmm. you can, uh, yeah. you can really get into that therapy in pop culture. Do you think that any particular uh, television show or movie that you've seen has nailed what it feels like to be in therapy or be providing therapy for another person? Mm, good question. I haven't personally seen anything, <laughs> but I don't have a lot of time um, either to be watching a lot of uh, consuming a lot of social media in terms of shows and and things like that. So I feel a bit, I'm a bit behind times with that. I ha- I haven't seen something where I'm like, oh yeah, that's what it's like, or that's I can relate to that. Um, so like when you catch an episode of Frasier, it's not like, come on, Frasier. <laughs> yeah, no, you know, mostly what I see uh, therapy when it's presented in films or movies, it's about the therapist either. <laughs> giving advice (laughs) like like typically the therapist is like this wise advice giver and the other person's looking for it um so it's like this transaction that's happening or they're more kind of like a life coach um 
or they're purely like psychoanalytic, right? They're just, they're constantly like, and how does that make you feel? Or <laughs> so you're telling me that- like two different stereotypes, I guess. So you're telling me you don't have like a big fainting couch that everyone lays down on uh, for sessions? Yeah, I don't. I don't. But I mean, that'd be kind of nice, maybe. But <laughs> I do have a couch in my office. <laughs> I I just that was one thing that I always kind of thought about. I was like, okay, so where is everyone finding these laying down couches that I see? Because to me, growing up a kid, pretty much raised by television, that's what I saw. That's what I thought counseling was: was going somewhere and laying down on a couch and talking and having someone sit behind you with a. Uh, piece of paper and write things down, which to me seems so uncomfortable because you seem to be at your most vulnerable at that point. You know, this person could be <laughs> eating a sandwich. They could have fallen yeah. asleep. They could be <laughs> uh, holding a knife. You don't know. Probably writing their grocery list behind you. <laughs> right. See, Katie, you understand what I'm getting at here. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. Do you have a, uh, I mean, and this doesn't have to be a, uh, uh, any kind of professional advice, but do you have any advice for that person out there who says, gosh, you know, I've taken some time during my self-isolation to check in with myself. And uh, I, I I have some questions and I, I have some needs, but I don't know how to get the process started. I think the hardest part of therapy is making that appointment and driving to your first or, or showing up to that first session because there's so many unknowns. You don't know how it's going to go yet. You don't know what the dance is going to look like. And I'd like to tell people that, um, you, you know, it's, it's <laughs> once you make that appointment, you've, you've done the hardest part. You know what I mean? It's, <laughs> if you can just make that appointment and show up to your first session, you've already gotten through the hardest part, you know, of, of getting the help that you might need or, or even just a safe place to figure the things out or goals that you'd like to have for yourself and your future. And you, you won't regret it once you do it. It's not something you're going to regret. Yeah. And that, isn't that a, an interesting word regret? Um, I think that a lot of times people uh, compartmentalize moments of their life and add up regrets from it. Like, Oh, this is something I regret about, you know, not doing or doing when I was young, or this is something I regret about my wedding day. This is something I regret uh, when I was uh, talking to my mom for what turned out to be the last time. And we mm-hmm. live in that world of regret. And I, I, I find it to be one of the things that even though it's done, it's over and it's in the past, it causes the most roadblocks to our future. Mm hmm. Yeah. I think it's easy to kind of like if you're if your life is like a big map of points and events. I I do see, you know, a lot of people tending to prioritize, not prioritize, but um, lump together what I would call the negative points on that map and create kind of like some kind of chart. And that's really powerful because that's a story you're telling yourself. And, you know, your, your life is kind of like a story and you've mapped, you've now mapped out and connected the points of your life that might be filled with regret. And if that's the story that you're going forward on, it's unhealthy. Mm, yeah. And it, it just being unhealthy for somebody can take so many different uh, ways that, you know, the person who uh, decides they cannot be uh they they can't talk to someone until they've had their second diet coke or cup of coffee for the day and that becomes your mental state of nope i i won't do this i i can't do this i can't function uh without this or the person who says gosh I, you know i'm having a bad day today so all my interactions are going to force everyone else to live the same bad day that i am uh, having right now, or the person who says, if I can't get this tomato plant to grow, I'm not a worthy human being. Um, <laughs> we just do stuff like that all the time. Yes. Yeah. That's actually one of the fun parts about therapy. I, 
<laughs> that's a bit lighter, obviously, than like some of the intense trauma work I do. So I really enjoy that as well. I, lo- I love variety in my work. And I love it when people come to me um, and have these issues because it's so much fun as a therapist to utilize that time when, okay, you are taking an hour out of your day or whatever to really work on this and you want to change. You know, we figured out why you want it to be different. I'm going to assign you something small, maybe a little bit of in vivo exposure to something you didn't think you could do or something you didn't think was possible and then you're gonna see that it was okay you know what I mean and then we can celebrate and we can celebrate all these like small little milestones on the journey and that can be really fun oh I think that's great and you know we I I did try and take this light because I uh, I believe in the the healing power of humor uh, when it comes to a lot of things But what you do is very serious, and I appreciate the fact that there are people like yourself out there doing it because it's going to make the human uh, race stronger as we go on when we can we can actualize things that have that that are causing us um, discomfort, that are causing us uh, the inability to grow or to communicate fully. So thank you for doing what you do, especially at The Village. What a great organization, The Village. We're so lucky that that exists in our community. Yes, I love where I work. Thanks so much for saying that. So as we wrap this thing up, Katie McGregor, uh, if people are interested in finding out, uh, you know, the services available for The Village, um, or maybe uh, they just are somebody who want to get into uh, the world of becoming a therapist as well. Could you walk me quickly through, um, like, where did you go to school and uh, how did you find where you are today? Sure. It's definitely not a straight path. Um <laughs> I did, I graduated from Miami University of Ohio in psychology. And at that time, um, I was heavily involved in figure skating and synchronized skating. Um, so I ended up moving to San Diego thinking I was going to continue professionally um, to figure skate and also get a master's degree in sports psychology. Our teams have always had a sports psychologist. I'd seen a sports psychologist quite a bit. Um, that was a peak interest for me. And then halfway through, I just became much more interested in my classes that were just about therapy. So I ended up moving back home and getting my master's in marriage and family therapy from NDSU. Um, We have some pretty strong programs in the area. And what I really love about the you know, marriage and family therapy work is it's a systems perspective about things. You're not just, you know, counseling really focuses on individuals. Psychology focuses on ADHD testing and all these different testing things. And and you're not really taking a big look at the larger system of the family and society and cultural dynamics at play. And so I really appreciated that about my master's degree. Um, and then of course there's constant ongoing education and, and things you can do in terms of specializations within your field of therapy. Very cool stuff. I love it. Uh, and then, uh, people can find the village here in Fargo just simply by Googling it. I happen to work right over by the village. So I see you guys all the time. And, um, Katie, thank you so much for making some time and, uh, being with us in a social distancing manner. I really appreciate it. <laughs> No problem. Thanks for having me. A huge thanks to Natalie Deutsch of Hatch Realty for sponsoring this podcast. Folks, if you're looking to buy or sell a home, contact Natalie Deutsch today because Natalie Deutsch is not only a previous podcast guest, she's somebody who's going to care enough to sell your property for top dollar. She's also going to find you the best price possible if you're purchasing a new home. Last year on average, Natalie earned her clients $4,000 over list price on their homes and sold them faster than the market average. On average, Natalie's selling a home every 3.74 days. That's two homes a week. Those numbers don't lie. Find out why Natalie is one of the top agents in this entire market. Get a hold of her today, Natalie at HatchRealtyFM.com. You can also call 701-388-9338 or go on to LiveFargoMoorhead.com. That's LiveFargoMoorhead.com. Read all of her amazing reviews and then listen to her episode of JJ Meets World. Thanks again to Natalie Deutsch of Hatch Realty.
That's going to wrap it up for today's show. If you enjoyed this episode of JJ Meets World and would like to help us continue to produce two new episodes every week, you can donate to our Patreon. Check out patreon.com slash JJ Meets World and donate today. Even as little as a dollar a month can go a long way. Visit our website at www.jjmeetsworld.com or hit up our social media. We're on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, all the sites the kids are using these days. If you'd like to stay up to date on new episodes of JJ Meets World, you can find us on iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, YouTube, or wherever you consume the podcast that you love. JJ Meets World is produced every week by Tucker Lucas. You can find out more about Tucker's work by checking out www.moonbasemaria.com. If you want to get in touch with your host with the most, go to linebenders.com, and you can find direct contact info for JJ. And if you decide that you would like to use my services, you can meet with the person at the front desk and you can schedule a time to meet with me, Sigmund Freud.